Hi, Men's community. Thanks for joining us for another episode brought to you by the Merrimack Institute for New Teacher Support at Merrimack College. This is another video in our community and civic engagement series that's housed on YouTube. Um, and today we are joined by Dr. Kirsty Dobbs. Um, and we're so excited. She has a wonderful presentation to share with us. So a little bit of uh, Kirsty's background is that she received her PhD from the Department of Political Science at Loyola University in Chicago in August. August 2019, and she earned her Bachelor of Arts in International Studies and in French at Butler University in May 2013. Uh, she's currently a full-time lecturer in the Department of Political Science and Public Policy at Merrimack College, um, working at the intersection of both comparative and international politics. She analyzes political behavior in both established and transitioning democracies. Specifically, she investigates the political behavior of youth and civil society functioning on political participation, civic engagement, and political socialization. She also possesses regional expertise in North Africa and the Middle East with a particular focus on elections, public opinion, and democratization. So thank you so much for being here tonight with us, and we're super excited to see what you have prepared for us. Thank you, Amanda, for that for that introduction. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen too while I get my uh, PowerPoint up. Yep, and it's on um, the perfect slide. We don't see any of the notes section, so you're all perfect. set. Awesome, great, um, great. Well, uh, thank you, everyone, for for joining our our presentation today. So, like Amanda said, I focus a lot of my work is on actually youth and political behavior, and um, trying to transition students to not only being knowledge seekers, but also being really focused on trying to make social and political change in their communities. And civic engagement projects serve multiple purposes. But one of those can be to actually really motivate young people to, to make positive change in their communities. Um, but that can be kind of a really big hurdle to take a project um, that's either a service learning uh, experience or a uh, community service and to transition, make the students transition from just completing a project to actually feeling empowered uh, throughout that process. And so um, there's a lot of different ways that you can do this. There's a lot of literature out there on this right now. What I'm going to be talking about today is kind of based on some of my experiences and, and be pulling from my background on youth and political behavior. And so I'm sure what you'll find here is you'll be able to adapt a lot of it to fit uh, your students. You know them best. You know your community the best and the environment that they're working in. But hopefully this can um, provide some a, a framework for you to at least think through the processes that you can use um, as an educator in terms of trying to motivate your students beyond just completing a civic engagement project to actually becoming persistent um, uh, kind of movers and shakers in their own communities. So I wanna start with this quote. It's one of my favorite quotes by um, Winston Churchill. And it talks about, it's kind of, it was made in a speech where Winston Churchill was making a call to young people to be change makers in their communities. And there's a lot of literature out there that you can look at um, where young people are serving as major agents of change throughout history. And so the quote reads, will you make, uh, so to youth, right? You will make all kinds of mistakes but as long as you are generous and true and also fierce, you cannot hurt the world. She was made to be wooed by and won by youth. She has lived and thrived only by repeated subjugations. So it's, I think it's important for us to reflect on as educators that it's, this isn't just us wanting to achieve our own kind of learning objectives in the classroom, but there's sort of this bigger picture about wanting to make sure we're, we're doing our part in terms of providing the support that young people need to be to make these repeated subjugations, because this is good in terms of progress and in terms of social change uh, for societies in general. And this is something that we've seen throughout history. And if you're take if you're watching this, I'm sure you are either becoming familiar familiar with or you are already very familiar with the civic engagement literature. And actually, a lot of this um, has actually been pulled um, by political science and especially political scientists who, who have worked in collaboration with people who um, do research in education. Um, but the definition that I'll be working from in this PowerPoint is civic engagement is working to make a difference in the civic life of one's community and developing the combination of knowledge, skills, values, and motivation to make that difference. 
It means promoting the quality of life in a community through both political and non-political processes. And so the reason that I have make a difference in values and motivation in bold um, in this definition is because I, I believe that this is kind of what you're gonna gather, uh, what we're gonna be focusing on in today's presentation is it's it, there's a lot of things that are wrapped up with civic engagement, but how do you actually make it so that students feel empowered to make a difference and that they're motivated to make a difference, right? And they develop, develop those value systems. And I think that this isn't, this isn't going to just happen organically unless uh, educators really do make a concerted effort to make sure that they are providing the space for students to start to adopt these values, right, and to become more motivated. I think it's sometimes a little bit naive of us to assume that because students are taking our course or because they've chosen this, this particular, um, you know, uh, if, if you're at a university, this particular college that focuses on service learning, um, that they are just going to have these values. I think a lot of times these things are developed. And I think that's why uh, educators seek to, to incorporate these sort of activities in classes to develop these skills. But how do we actually make sure that our, uh, our hold our students accountable, actually, in terms of making sure that they're developing sort of those values that, that we're hoping that they do? And so the big question that we're trying to answer in this presentation is how do you promote your students to act as agents of social um, and political change? And I think based on kind of my research in terms of political activism and revolutions, one of the biggest success components of any, of any movement that's trying to instigate change is unity and solidarity. And so what you want to accomplish in terms of trying to answer this big question is, is, is how you create solidarity between your students and the communities that they're working with. And so this is another quote that I like, and this is actually pulled from the Free Child Institute. They have a list of quotes up, and that is an institute that actually promotes youth and social change, and it might be another useful resource for you. But the quote, I don't believe in charity, I believe in solidarity. Charity is vertical, so it's humiliating. It goes from the top to the bottom. Solidarity is horizontal. It respects the other and learns from the other. I have a lot to learn from other people by Eduardo Galino. And so I think that's kind of sometimes, um, I think students maybe who are doing civic engagement projects for the first time, they might interpret this project as charity, right? Something that they're giving out to the community. And what I would encourage you to think of is trying to reframe these projects into it being about solidarity and not about charity, about you working with people horizontally and not just looking down on people maybe in some instances not saying that that's happening in the projects that you're working on but i think that this quote um draws makes puts good attention on the fact that what we are trying to do in terms of civic engagement projects is to create solidarity to create connections and networks with our students and the communities they're working with and to form respect and and to create students who are open to learning from others right who are outside of their immediate community and so I think this brings forth two kind of extended questions. Not only how do you make them social agents of change, but how do you control for ethnocentrism and encourage students to move beyond their own cultural boundaries of understanding? And second, how do you address power imbalances between the student and the community? So ethnocentrism um, is, uh, in, in most basic terms, is when people uh, take their own cultural understandings and how the cultural kind of understandings that you ascribe to other people, you just, that's what you run with. Like my, so my understanding of the world as a white female and how I've learned uh, to understand maybe the Mexican immigrant community next to me, I'm gonna take my perspective and that's how I'm gonna understand that community. What we wanna do, that's ethnocentrism. And what we wanna do is kind of deconstruct that to be able to take someone, to take a student, put them in a new community and encourage them to be open to learning from those who are across cultural boundaries and not just ascribing kind of their own perceptions or their own biases onto those communities that they're working with. And a lot of times this does end up um, addressing certain power imbalances that can um, be present between a student and the community, but also between yourself as the educator right in the room there's always going to be a power um, asymmetry between you and a student perhaps that's also um, extending into the communities that you're working with so it's something that's really important to reflect on as you're as you're engaging in these type of activities and so the agenda for this for this little lecture is to kind of discuss four major steps to encourage critical thinking and introspective reflection that I think will help 
answer those three questions. And then while doing that, I'll also be providing two examples. So the four major steps that, um, that I've kind of pulled from my own experiences and my own background, research background, are to first frame your project, two, reflect on positionality, three, intellectually engage with the project, and four, provide a space for post-reflection. So this first step, frame your project. So you want to give your project um, some sort of socio-political framing to it. And this is typically the hardest part for people who maybe don't have as much of a background in politics, right, or in sociology or something like that. It's typically the area where people who come from more of a STEM background are needing the most support. So maybe that's you, right? We're all going to be coming from different areas. Maybe think about, okay, what is my background? Do I think more like, you know, more of that uh, kind of chemistry, biology, uh, black and white right, type of perspective, or am I more like a political scientist or a sociologist and, and I understand things more from the social perspective? We're all going to be somewhere right in that, in that ratio. Um, but if you are someone who is coming from that more of the hard science arena, this might be something that's new for you. And so some big questions you want to consider when you're thinking about framing your project in these terms is what are the underpinning socio-political issues that are shaping this project? In other words, why does this activity even exist? Typically in a civic engagement project, you're creating something where students are going to make a positive impact. They're going to do good, do something good. But why is it that we need to do good here? Why is this seemingly maybe a gap that's not being filled in these communities, right? There's going to be some sort of socio-political um, dynamics that are typically at play in a lot of civic engagement projects. Now, I'll, this is going to vary definitely on the type of project that you're doing, but I want to encourage you to at least kind of reflect on this when you're first starting these projects. And so some examples, so this, so the two examples I have, this first one is the park bench one. And this one I think is uh, one that is more common maybe in, in like a the K through middle school, maybe type of environment. And maybe at first glance doesn't seem like a political, uh, you know, type of activity that would be going on. But some questions you might want to consider if you're doing say this, putting up and constructing uh, benches in a park, right? First, why is there an inadequate supply of park benches in this area? So your class right, has identified that we want to build more benches in this park. Well, why do you need more? Why is there a lack of them? Why are your students particularly fulfilling this need? Right? Is there, do your students have more resources than maybe the people who help run the park do? Why does this park suffer from lack of park benches, whereas the park down the street does not? That's another good way to kind of think about socio-political dynamics is to do a comparison to the community that you're wanting to work in and then maybe comparing it to the community next door. Right or or a community maybe another in another state you you will know for yourself like what's the appropriate comparison but a lot of times what's happening is there's inequality right as we're working across communities and a lot of times civic engagement projects where they're attracted to areas where there is an imbalance where there is inequality in some way and you're seeking to help improve upon that um, in a lot of different ways even something as as seemingly as simple as putting up park benches. The second example that I have is maybe something you might see more in high school. Um, this is something I remember I did um, as part of my civic engagement when I was in high school with tutoring. Um, so in this situation, you have either high school students or college students who are tutoring younger students, right? Um, so some questions you might wanna consider in terms of the framing. Why is tutoring these students considered a service to the community, right? We, I think students can easily grasp the benefits of tutoring, right? A lot of your students maybe have a tutor, right? And they know what those benefits are. But is there something different or specific about um, you doing service with these students, right? What gap are you trying to fill as a tutor for these students? Um, in a situation, uh, in this example that I'm thinking of, right, um, there are students who are in an underserved community where there is less funding, right, for their school system. And so there's been this civic engagement project that's been created where you have students who are a little bit older, who have a little bit more uh, of, a, of an educational background are going in helping these students. They're filling a gap, right? So a gap in these students learning or understanding that is not you know, necessarily the fault of any of the teachers that are there, but maybe is, is more of a reflection of a broader 
um, uh, inequality in terms of access to education. Um, so why does this gap exist in the first place? And then why are we tutoring at this school and not the high school in the next county over, right? Are these, are these kids that we're tutoring need our services more than the, the kids that are next door? And why is that? So these are just examples of some things of, of how you can kind of so, think through the socio-political dynamics that are shaping the type of civic engagement project that you might be working on. So the second step to reflect on positionality. So everyone has positionality. You have your own experiences, your own background, your own belief systems, and you're always going to be oriented in a specific way that's unique to you, to the individuals around you, right, to the communities that you're working in. And so some questions you might want to consider for yourself, but also for your students are maybe what are your own biases and prejudices? Right? Sometimes we don't spend a lot of time thinking about those sort of things. A lot of times our friends tend to have similar ideas like us, or maybe our family members have the same ideas. We don't always identify that these are biases or prejudices, right? So it's, it's important to provide some space to reflect on that. You could think about what is your worldview, right? Um, a lot of times young people tend to be a lot more liberal, right? And older people tend to be a lot more conservative. That could be something related to your worldview. What are my political leanings and how do they shape my values and belief system, right? Republican versus Democrat. A lot of younger people um, are uh, identifying more as independent or they're really getting on board with like the Green Party. And the, you, the students you're working with, maybe they're not politically energized yet. They're, they're younger, right? But there might be something about maybe their, their families, right? I'm assuming parents and families that they're going to have some sort of ideological background. And that's going to be impacting the students and how they see the world. And this is going to in turn impact their experience with these civic engagement projects. And it's important that they start to get in touch with that. And so then finally, what is my position in these communities I'm going to engage with, right? My position as a white female, right, is going to be uh, who is um, more moderate, grew up in a Democrat household, is going to be different than a colleague of mine who maybe is Hispanic, also grew up in a Democrat household, but maybe is a first generation, right? We're gonna have different positions when we're working in, in communities kind of based on, our, based on our background. And those are important things to understand. And so back to our examples with the park benches. So some questions you might consider um, either for yourself or to ask your students. Right, how do these students, you're like, okay, we're gonna build these benches. It's gonna be great, we're gonna do this next week. And then ask the students, well, how do you feel about building and adding benches to this park? Right, are they comfortable with this project? Why do they feel this way? Right, are they comfortable about going to that park? Have they been to the park before? Why or why not? Um, what are their current perceptions of the park? Is it a safe park? Is it a fun park? Would they go there after dark? Right? And of course, you're going to change these questions up based on the students that you're working with. And this will probably differ drastically by the age, for sure. Um, but then finally, what are uh, your perceptions of the community where the park resides? Right, Because building park benches isn't just about allowing more spaces for people to sit. Right, It's about the community and having impact on the people that are there, not benches, right? not sidewalks. Maybe this is an older community and what your students have noticed or you have noticed is that um, a lot of people walk in this park, but there's not a lot of places to sit and they are an older, uh, older crowd. So maybe they would appreciate that would improve their experience or quality of life, you know, in the park. Um, maybe you just think that more people would enjoy the park if they had a place to sit where they could watch their kids, that sort of thing. But think about your experiences and your perceptions of these areas that you're going to be working and how these perceptions, how the experience you have had has have shaped these perceptions. So that's one place to start. With my kind of more, um, uh, com maybe, I, I wouldn't say it's a more complex example, but might be more, uh, more suitable for an older student base. Um, but if you're doing the tutoring, right? What are your perceptions of students at this high school? So I was thinking in this example of college students tutoring high school students. So I'm asking the college students, what are your perceptions of these students? How do you think these students are different or similar to you? What do you think explains these differences or similarities? Are you comfortable going to their campus, right? There, there could be something um, 
that could be impacting their experience with this project if they are at a um, a smaller private liberal arts school with maybe a thousand students, but they're about to go to a high school that has 4,000 students, right? That, that could be impacting their engagement there and shaping their experiences. And it's something they should be aware of. Um, what do you know about the community where the high school is located, right? And what experiences have you had that shape these perceptions, right, in this community? And then what power dynamics might be at play that you need to consider. So especially in a position where you're going to be having older students work with younger students, there's going to be a power dynamic at play there. Right. And you want your students to be aware of this power dynamic that you're going in, maybe you're the college student and you're working with a high school student and they might be too nervous or scared to challenge you on something that's going on. But if you're aware of that power dynamic and you can kind of figure out ways to to lessen that and to view them as more equals to create a connection. Right. When you sit down with these students that you just don't start going in right away and attacking their paper or their math or, or what have you, but maybe form some sort of connection with them that, that makes you see them. As, as equals, um, that can really help uh, um, the experience in terms of being able for your students to learn from the community that they're working with. And then step three, intellectually engage with project. So have them complete the project while they engage with some more nuanced questions. So a lot of sometimes um, you have the project, you let students go, maybe you're with them, maybe you're not, and they just want to get in and get it done. Right. Um, maybe they this they are aware of this, right? They know they just want to get it done, or maybe they are enjoying it, but they're not really kind of taking a minute to pause and think and really absorb about the experience that they're having. So some questions you might want to consider while they are engaging with the project is how are you feeling working in this environment? Right? Are you having a good time? Are you comfortable? Does this seem very foreign to you? What is surprising to you? Right. When you walk in, maybe you had one thought and then you saw something completely different about the type of culture, right, or the type of people that are there. Um, what is confusing to you and but what also feels relatable. So these are kind of big questions that you can consider while they're working in a project. And then back to the example. So like if you're with your students at the park, maybe have students look at the surroundings and what do they see. Is there trash anywhere? Is the park well kept? How are the students treated by onlookers while they build these benches, right? Are they, are they welcomed or are they kind of, you, what are these kids doing here? They need to get off my block sort of situation. Do they, and then do the students, do they feel powerful when engaging in this activity? When what is giving them the sense of power? And I don't know if I would use the term, do you students feel powerful right now, right? That, uh, that I don't think is the connotation you want to give to your students, but something about, do they feel like they're, what they're doing is actually impactful? Right, and that this is this is they have actually the ability to do something good while they're here right now um, in this environment. And then back to the high school example, maybe I would ask my students, what are your impressions of the high school? Does there appear to be an appropriate faculty slash student ratio? What images do you see? Kind of what is the culture right of the area that you're working in? How are you treated by the students, by the faculty and the administration? I just want them to be aware, right, of the environment that they're working in and not just thinking, okay, I need to get to the room and work with that student and sit down with them and get these things done. I want them to be aware of the environment and I want them to start seeing the big picture of what they're doing and not just the task at hand. And then step four, post-reflection. So I want you to allow space for introspective reflection on biases and orientations towards community and to develop a plan for action going forward. So some big questions you can consider are, do any of your previous perceptions change? Right, they had that kind of previous reflection that they did. I know in my class, I actually had them do a pre-reflection and a post-reflection where they actually look at their previous reflection and like, oh, that's what I said two months ago. Oh, I don't feel that way anymore. Right? What did they learn? How did they personally connect with this project? And then finally, do they feel empowered to make positive change in their community after this sort of project? And so this, in going back to the two examples, this might take the form of if you're doing some sort of park bench example, were your biases or perceptions confirmed or did they change after the project um, about the park? Why or how did they change or not change? So these are kind of related to the questions that we had a few slides ago about the park. What positive change did you see in the park after the benches were built? Did you see any negative changes? What else do you think needs to be done to improve the park and how could this be achieved? And how could they play a role in this particular goal? 
with the high school example, I might ask them if any of their biases or perceptions of the students, right, specifically changed after working with them and what led to this change. Did any perceptions of the community change after tutoring? What positive change did they see in the students or community as a result of the tutoring? And what could still be done to prove upon the education and gap in this community? If this is what they've kind of identified as being the reason why they're there and what role could they play? So the overall goals of um, kind of going through this very reflective kind of analytical critical thinking, always kind of um, implementing at every stage of, the, of this civic engagement project is to develop a deeper sense of awareness of their own prejudices, biases, and possible sources of discrimination to those in the community. Hope that it leads to a critical reflection on the role of ethnocentrism and positionality when engaging with communities outside of the classroom. Who am I and, and how does that impact these people that I'm working with and the work that I'm doing? I hope that it deconstructs the ethnocentrism that inherently exists in community projects. We don't know what we don't know, right? We're gonna go into these, these community projects relying on the information that we have that is sometimes at that point in our life only being pulled by our own cultural community. But as we're engaging with these other, these cross-cultural boundaries, I hope students start to become open, right, to not just relying on their preconceived notions, but learning from these other communities and letting that, you know, kind of shape the experience and shape what they believe should be the learning outcomes of, of whatever it is that they're doing. And then it provides mutual opportunities for growth. So it's not just them going into a community and helping this community grow, but they're growing as well. Right? And so you see more of that, that horizontal collaboration, that more mutually beneficial kind of relationship that, would, that we hope manifests in the civic engagement projects that we do. And then ultimately I hope it empowers the student to serve as an agent of social change. So again, everything that I've mentioned so far is definitely adaptable. Um, of course, the level and complexity of the questions you're gonna be asking is gonna be adapted based on the age of the student for sure. Um, but I think it's important that no matter what age you're working at, that these students are encouraged to think about things outside of their own cultural boundaries, to learn from the people that they're working with and not to just always assume that they're the ones going in and doing the good work, right? Um, and that uh, they view themselves in solidarity. And that's kind of the, the big thing is they, they view themselves as one with this community. They have goal, they have similar goals with this community that they can have, even if they're completely different in terms of sociodemographics, that they have a shared, shared things that they, they want to work on together. And that solidarity is really going to what is going to be what moves uh, young people forward in terms of them working together to make social change in their communities. So I don't know, Amanda, do you have any questions? Oh gosh. Um, no, I feel like I really just have takeaways that I was going to just share at the end, um, but I, I don't know if you had another slide or um, if you wanted to unshare, we can go back to a side by side screen. Um, but on the top of my head, no burning questions right now, really just positive takeaways. <laughs> I think this is so okay. Great. Yeah, I will. I'll go ahead and unshare. Um, and uh, um, yeah, I'm just so thankful for, first of all, you and this presentation for so many reasons. Um, if you've been following, and this is to the Mint community, if you've been following our videos, um, we've seen a lot of education faculty and community partners more recently. And so this is really the first time that we've been able to branch out, out of the Winston School of Education and Social Policy um, into a new department and into a new school on Merrimack's campus. So I'm really happy that you were able to share um, just this political science perspective perspective, but also obviously relating to the education field, um, but even just like those key words of positionality, ethnocentrism. Um, I think the examples were awesome and I loved how it was able to, you know, tie in with K through middle, but then also with some examples for a high school student um, and high school classroom. And I thought the, the steps were just so easy to follow and these questions were so important. Um, honestly, some of these questions I, I wish I learned earlier, but I definitely learned more once once I got into college. So whether a student is able to watch this video or if the um, K-12 educators are able to relay this information down to the students, um, I think it just is so valuable, so important. Um, but yeah, those were really just my main takeaways and I'm so excited for people to watch this and to hopefully implement some of these ideas and especially questions into their, you know, their school life. So, um, but I did wanna also just take this last minute to um, leave the floor open to you if you had any last final thoughts or words. Um, 
but that's all I have. I'm just so thankful. Yeah, that was, I'm, I'm glad that you found it uh, digestible and accessible, right, for the some of the framework that I provided. But I just want to note that the field of education and sociology and psychology, a lot of those fields have done work on the impact of ethnocentrism mm -hmm. and positionality on civic engagement. So political science is definitely, you know, not alone or or even, I would say, the leader, <laughs> right, in this right. at all. Um, it's definitely been cross interdisciplinary in terms mm -hmm. of asking those questions. But I think the one thing that a political scientist does do is that we're trained to think in terms of power. We're always mm -hmm. thinking about power, deconstruct power, how to resolve issues of governance. So when we see the issue with the park benches, we're thinking, well, where does that funding come from? Who's supposed to provide that? What politician said that they were concerned about the park? Where's the parks department? That's kind of worth how we think. That's just the way mm -hmm. our brains have been wired or trained to be so so I think uh, getting political scientists you know engaged with with the other departments across campus in terms of doing this type of work we'll, we'll just kind of always be the ones that are that are like how do we deconstruct the power systems at play mm -hmm. and how do we improve upon governance right um, in these mm -hmm. communities and so I think that is the perspective political science can bring thank you for clarifying that yeah no that's great um, and like I said, I just really can't thank you enough. Um, and if any of you have any questions or additional comments, please reach out to the MINS mailbox at mints at merrimack.edu. And I can forward any, you know, questions or thoughts over to, to Kirsty and we can get you guys in touch. But, um, but that's all I have for today. And I think that's all Kirsty has for today. So thank you so much again, and we'll see you in the next episode, everybody. Have a great night. Bye.